When you think about it and how fitting and appropriate it is that our first experience of Easter as children is Easter baskets, Easter candy, Easter eggs, little marshmallow peeps, and we have jelly beans and chocolate. Remember that? We always knew that the ears of the bunny were solid chocolate. So isn't it great? Our, our first experience of Easter is one of fun and lightheartedness and candy and Easter egg hunts and sitting around Easter, eating Easter candy all the time. And, and this is interesting, too, here. We look at this. We have this little peep, little bunny thing here, little soft stuffed animal. And so this is such a great Great way to start our first experience of Easter. And I'd like to thank Deacon Terry Daly for lending us his Easter basket. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sure you're watching Deacon Terry. And uh, it's so nice. It was great because uh, Brian set this all up. Brian, you did a great job. And uh, and it was great because they he had a little, he had to find his Easter basket. Brian's giving him all these hints and everything like that. It took him two hours. He finally found it. It was in the dryer. <laughs> so thank you, Terry. But, you know, so we have this first experience of being a child and having candy and Easter egg hunts. There was an Easter egg hunt here yesterday for all the kids, and they had a great time. And Dave Costello gave ice cream to everybody, and there's nothing, there's nothing like that, right? And yet, you know, when we're, we're children, uh, you know, appropriately so and developmentally so, it's, it's all about us, right? You know, we have this, it's, it's all about me. What we think about pretty much is ourselves. Even when you think of a baby, aren't they cute? Aren't they cute? And yet, really, they're always crying and whining and complaining. And, and the minute you don't give them what they want, you're going to know about it. It's all about the baby. And very often as we grow up, we have an experience where we're preoccupied with self. We're what you might call egocentric. Egocentric is, it's all about me. All I think about is myself and am I getting my needs met? But then what we gotta do though is we have to grow and evolve. We have to grow and evolve in our consciousness where we move from being egocentric and then we start moving into caring about people in our family, maybe our parents, hopefully they give us some chores to do. I know you gave your kids chores to do. <laughs> so give it chores, which is important, right? It's actually actually very important for a child to learn chores, to learn responsibilities, to have a sense of taking care of something outside themselves, a dog, a cat, something. And then we grow and we keep on evolving. We start thinking about people in our community and people in the world, and people in life and what's going on for people caring about them, feeding the poor, clothing the people who need food and clothes. And then we'll move probably to this higher state of consciousness, which is spirit-centric. We move into a higher level of understanding who we are as human beings. Now, when you think about it, so when we have this egocentric mindset. It's a consciousness. And make no mistake about it. Our consciousness determines our life. How we see things in life totally affects the quality of our life. So if people remain egocentric, they remain self-centered and self-absorbed, they, they live in that their whole life. And very often their life is one of frustration and dissatisfaction. So you can have these four levels of consciousness. So you can have life happens to me. So I am a victim. Life happens to me. I live at the effect of everything around me. Life happens by me where I have to control things. I have to make sure if it's, if it's not, if I don't do it, it's not going to happen. So I have to kind of control the situation. Now, not to say that we don't take responsibility and that's a good thing. But sometimes when we live in that life happens by me, we can kind of want to force things. We have to have things go our particular way. And then we move more into a level of life happens through me. 
so that I allow life to flow through me. And out of that comes the sense of giving and loving and contributing to other people. And it's that when we start to have the sense of a spiritual awakening that is not just on me, but something is flowing through me, some sort of a spirit, some sort of an energy and intelligence is flowing through me. And I don't live my life totally on my own accord. You know, one of the most powerful things in AA is I come to know a power greater than myself to restore me to sanity. So there's that, that healing power in all those 12-step programs always comes from this awareness that there's a power that flows through the individual to bring about healing. Now, the highest phase of consciousness is a sense of spiritual oneness, that I am one with life, that we're all one with each other that we're all these spiritual energies coming here together this morning. And this is what Jesus was talking about when he says, I pray, Father, that they come to understand that they are one with you, just like I have come to understand that I am one with you. And so Jesus walked around with this highest state of consciousness that he was one with all, and that he knew that the self-giving, self-emptying, radical love was the call of a human being. Actually, when you think about it, that is who we are. That is our nature. Our nature is not to be self-centered and to be occupied with ourselves. Our true nature is to come from a place of love and to give and to come out of ourselves. And this was what Christ was talking about in his message. Now today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. He's in this tomb. The stone is rolled over. Guards are there to make sure that nobody can steal the body. And we hear the story of Mary Magdalene coming there to anoint the body. And she's broken hearted. She's grieving. She's so sad. She has lost the, the love of her life, Jesus. And she's grieving and she's sad. And we know that the disciples were living in a state of fear. They, did, they were hiding. So <clears throat> when they go to the tomb and they see that the stone has been removed, they don't know what to make of it. They think that somehow Jesus has been moved. Somebody moved him. And it's interesting when you think of the passages where they're talking about the linens being rolled up neatly, you know, by the side. You know, so they're trying to say, like, hey, no, there's no grave robber here. Grave robbers don't come in and roll up the linen and fold it over on the corner. It's a deliberate statement about these linens that this was not, the body was not stolen by anyone. And even this huge stone, they had it like where it was rolled down a little bit so that you needed like, you know, six or seven, I don't know how many Roman soldiers. And these were like linebackers for the New York Giants uh, who were there to push this thing back up. So they're trying to let you know something dramatic happened in that moment. And you know, we want to ask ourselves, what happened? What happened to these human beings that they went from grieving and sadness and fear to this radical transformation in their being, in their mind and in their heart? Something happened. They had this moment of enlightenment. Wow. Everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus stood for, all of his behavior, all of his conduct, his, his entire way of being was true, was right. In this resurrection, Jesus is totally vindicated and validated 
that God says yes to Jesus. And in this moment, scripture says, God raises Jesus from the dead. And in this moment, he becomes the Christ. He becomes the anointed. And more importantly, we all understand that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Everything that Jesus said and stood for gets vindicated and validated in this resurrection. Wow. This self-giving love, this emptying, this not clinging to life, self-preservation, which is such a powerful part of being human. And Jesus is radically calling us to not live a life of life happens to me, by me, but through me and in this oneness with all of people. Now we know how Jesus got in the tomb. We know about Jesus' tomb. But what about our tomb? What tomb do we live in? What tomb are we living in where Christ is calling us this morning to come out of that tomb and to come alive? We could live in a tomb of drug addiction, alcoholism. We could live in the tomb of holding a grudge and being resentful. We could live in a tomb of not forgiving. We can live in a tomb that I am everything that has happened to me, that I am my story. We can live in a tomb from some conclusion we drew so long ago that I'm not good enough. We can live in the tomb of I'm inadequate. There's something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. We can live. There's so many tombs that we can live in. And sometimes we can be in that tomb for so long that we're not even quite sure we want the stone to be rolled away. We don't know if we want to have that stone rolled away and the beaming light of Jesus Christ coming through to come and heal us and call us out of that tomb. Call us into the fullness and the abundance of life. Let's make no mistake about it. The story, the event, the reality of the resurrection. Something happened to these people. Something happened. There was a power that flowed out into their heart and into their mind. It's in on the Easter vigil. There is a, a, a reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. And in that story, in that passage, it says, God is saying, I'm going to give them a new heart. I'm going to give them a natural heart. I'm going to give them a heart that is able to know me. A natural heart of love. That God has given to each one of us this morning. A new heart. A new mind. God is giving us a power and an ability beyond ourselves this is such a key, essential part of the Christian message. That we live with a power beyond ourself and that this power is, is right here all the time to flow through us. We've got to come out of our tomb. And we've got to know that we have the power of Christ to come out of that tomb. Paul Tillich said, if I were to sum up all of Christianity, it would be two words. New creation. That when you think of our Christianity, it isn't really a religion. It isn't a bunch of rituals and um, liturgies, and those are all great. Those are all wonderful. 
only, only, only to the point that the rituals and the liturgies and the practice of religion creates and develops an ability for each one of us to become a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. To live with that consciousness, that spiritual consciousness of oneness with all of life. To live in the spiritual consciousness that we're already in eternal life. Resurrection isn't an event that's going to take place sometime in the future. We're sharing in Christ's resurrection as daughter read. But that's not an event that happens at some point in time in the future. Resurrection is something that happens right here, right now, today. Come out of our tomb and come alive in Christ Jesus. This is the message of Christianity. To become brand new and to know that you live with a power beyond yourself. So I wonder if we could just pray for a moment, if you could put your hand over your heart. And Lord Jesus, we give our hearts to you. We give our life to you. We say yes to your power that you have given to us this day on Easter. This resurrected power, we say yes that we live with a power beyond ourselves to restore us to wholeness, to be healed in body and mind, to come out of our tomb and to rise and to live our life in you. Thank you for giving us a brand new heart. Amen. Now you know. Peeps. <laughs> Where are you? You know what's funny too? When you look at jelly beans, remember when we were kids, you had about five, six flavors. Now you got coconut, pineapple, pina colada, <laughs> cinnamon. Now if I have this jelly bean, mm, it does taste good. I have to admit. I think it's like cotton candy. But this jelly bean, the flavor and the taste of the jelly bean, like so many things in this life, in this earth, they come and go. This jelly bean will go away. It only lasts for a little while. But the power of the risen Christ, the power of that is inside each one of us, this experience of eternal life, that power lasts forever. 